I'm Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. On today's show, I'll talk to Lloyd Handworker, the director of a new documentary about his grandfather's legendary Coney Island hot dog stand. It's called Famous Nathan. Stick around. This is going to be one tasty treat. I guarantee it. Growing up in New Jersey, my grandparents frequently took me by bus and train out to Brooklyn to visit my great Aunt Bess and great Uncle Max. Sometimes we stayed in their tiny apartment and Aunt Bess cooked. But sometimes my grandfather and I went off and spent the day at Coney Island, riding the rides and eating a hot dog and fries at the block long Nathan's famous hot dog stand right out on the boardwalk. I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Last night I watched Lloyd Handworker's documentary film famous Nathan, and it brought back all the memories, the tastes, the smells, and the sights all rushing back to me. Handworker is the grandson of the founder of Nathan's, Nathan Handworker. And while he himself never worked in the family business, he's put together a movie packed with old film, pictures, and interviews that immediately took me back in time to a place I treasured visiting with my own grandfather. Or, as I told my wife this morning, It took me to a place I had recalled hundreds of times in dreams and never thought I'd see exactly that way again. To quote the film's description of Nathan Handwerker, there was one Babe Ruth in baseball, one Einstein in science, and one Nathan in the food business. Famous Nathan captures a moment and a salty, kosher taste in time, replete with enough dirty family laundry. This brother hated that one. Mama never loved Papa. So-and-so was cheap to give anyone a delicious nosh, whether you've ever been to Coney Island or not. Lloyd Handworker, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. Glad to have you. And hey, Lloyd, screw the interview. Let's go get some food. <laughs> <laughs> really? I, don't, I think it'll be a long journey to uh, Coney Island for you. That's Not true. Favor. Damn worth it, though, I think. Um, I got to ask, before we really get into the meat of the, the, pardon me, the meat of the movie, that's a pun. I didn't make, mean to make that. There's going to be a lot of those, I, I'm sure. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to do my best not to. But, I mean, yeah. do you have a favorite treat from Nathan's? Because, uh, I mean, for me, it's the, it was the crinkle cut fries, which I remember as being big and chunky as your thumb and smothered in what I think was sea salt. Uh, well, I remember as a kid eating the shrimp boat, actually. I think I had my preference was for seafood, but of course, yeah, French fries would be next. Um, I did eat the hot dog on occasion, and I did enjoy it, but um, I think the fries would be top my list. It kind of spoiled me for everyone else. I mean, it's very hard to, you know, I went, uh, actually, before doing the interview, I don't have a, a, a Nathan's anywhere near me, and of course, they just don't compete, the, the franchises don't compete with the the original. But yeah. So I went into a Wendy's, because they advertise the sea salt fries, and I got them... I'm sorry, Wendy. It's just not the same. It's just- well, yeah, yeah, the sea salt. That's interesting. I'm not uh, remembering about anything to do with sea salt. So I know they had, I know they had salt, and I know they had ketchup, yeah. but I don't remember a specific. I, uh, I, I could be wrong about that, but I, I, it was the only place I remembered having the big chunks of salt on it, as opposed to the the really f- refined. Uh, right. uh, what's the What's the one that the, the, it pours? Uh, Anyway. Morton's or... Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah, speaking, no, I, speaking of condiments, I didn't plan to ask you about this, but there's a great story in, in there about the mustard. Yeah. You wanna, can you share that with people? Well, are you talking about the, the, how the mustard was served in those days? Well, and the, and, the, and the reason that it stopped being served that way. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I was thinking initially about the, uh, the mustard being thrown at one of the counters, <laughs> too. But, and that, that kind of stuff went on all the time, but... Yeah, I mean, they served the mustard in big open bowls, um, and they had these uh, wooden, um, I, I don't know what you call them exactly, but wooden um, spatulas, let's put it, just a, actually a wooden stick that you, you know, dipped into the mustard and, and spread the, the mustard on your hot dog. And the, the rumor that goes that um, one particular time someone dropped LSD into the mustard and, you know, we're, uh, customers got high and <laughs> complained, and they shut down the uh, mustard bones. Uh, of course, I've had other people say it was just, you know, health workers who, you know, at that time, I guess, thought open mustard bowls were not 
particularly uh, a good thing for, for people to be eating out of. So I, I don't know the truth of that story, um, just that there are rumors about it. All right. And folks, stick yeah. around because later in the show we're going to come back to uh, LSD. Um, <laughs> this, yeah. this is another good story. Um, all right. So for people uh, – now I try to describe uh, – my Coney Island, my, my, my Nathan's experience. But for people who may have never been out there, um, uh, how would you, you know? How would you ex- ex- explain the uh, genuine Nathan's experience? Um, well, I, I guess if we're talking about the '40s and '50s because that's what I think of as the genuine Nathan's experience. Maybe leading into the early '60s, um, lots of people, lots of crowds um, waiting out front. Uh, Workers on the front counter, the griddle was on the front counter so you could see your food being prepared. Uh, you know, patter from the workers. They had little songs that they used to sing, little, you know, words that they used to shout at the crowd to try to bring them in to, uh, to eat at the, at the counter. Um, there was no sort of semblance of a line, um, even though... You know, there was one area where you you could only buy the hot dog and one area where you could only get the drink and one area where you could only get the hamburger, hamburger, unlike most fast food places, unlike what Nathan's is today, where you can order everything at one station. It was actually one item per station. So it might seem totally chaotic, but the workers had a particular method of uh, looking at the crowd and and figuring out who they were going to serve next. They would sort of go from left to right and then come back and... And, uh, you know, they were super fast. So these guys were professionals who'd been there for 30 years, many of them. There was one guy named Sammy Fiorello who was there for more than 40 years, who was known to have served 60 hot dogs and give change in one minute. And uh, that's not a, you know, falsehood. He was timed by a number of people, and I, I've had that verified by, by quite a few people who were around during that time. So super fast service. You would have to either go on to another line to get your drink or, or another item, but usually I guess you're there with several people, so you know people spread out on different lines. But um, just you know, a great atmosphere, lots of people, particularly if you're talking on a weekend or, or, or a holiday. And um, you know, Coney Island was alive with with uh, amusement parks and and you know all kinds of uh, stuff to do down there, and and of course a wonderful beach. So. Um, you know, and the smells were great. Um, they used to have a trick of putting onions on the griddle um, when they saw that a train was pulling into the station because they <laughs> knew that that smell was going to waft across the street. So that was one of the ways of bringing people in. Plus, uh, you know, enormous signs. I mean, if you've never seen Nathan's before, um, not, they're, they're neon signs at night, but during the day, they're just, they were all hand painted signs. In those days, uh, stretching quite high up into the sky with all kinds of sayings and phrases and, you know, and, and the items of food. And, um, of course, uh, everything was very inexpensive in those days. Um, you know, I think the hot dog had risen, depending on when, when you're talking, in the 40s at some point to 10 cents. It, it had stayed a nickel from 1916 until 1946 or thereabouts. So very inexpensive food, high quality, because my grandfather was really a fanatic and was there all the time checking the quality. Um, you know, so you, you'd get a great meal uh, at a low price, and you, you'd love the atmosphere. And it's kind of a family feeling that this was the original fast food joint, not McDonald's. McDonald's came after this. Yeah, well, and Nathan started in 1916. They, uh, you know, McDonald's really wasn't around until the 50s. So Nathan's, uh, as one of the workers said, was uh, king of the hill for, for many years. And, you know, of course, many people, including my father and my uncle, wanted to expand it and do something similar to McDonald's. My grandfather was only interested in the one place because, uh, you know, he couldn't see to down the block to another place, uh, he would say, I can't see to Oceanside, I can't be in Oceanside. You know, the quality is going to suffer. He was successful in Coney Island. He had no interest in, you know, taking it across the country. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was there way before McDonald's. Now, you made this film uh, about the place and about its, the founder, your grandfather. So I'm guessing that you sort of, from hearing you talk, 
you get Nathan's in a way that maybe not all members of the handworker family kind of get it. You, I, I get the sense that you see it, uh, and a, you have a broader picture. Yeah, I mean, I approach this subject like I would a journalist, you know, as if I was a journalist. And um, from a very early age, I started recording relatives about the uh, the history of the place and trying to understand my family, understand my grandfather a little more, my grandmother, their relationship, how, how he was as a boss in the business, how he was in, within the family structure. Um, you know, he died when I was 17, so I, I knew him up to a point. But um, there was a whole lot more to learn, and uh, I was interested in, in learning everything that I could. So I, even to this day, I'm still finding people out there, old-time workers, who I, I, I'm still asking questions from. So yeah, I would say that there's no one else in my family who's done the kind of extensive research about my grandparents and about the place and, 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 the, and the history. So, yeah. And so that was something I wanted to clarify, too. There's a lot of... Uh, footage from over different periods of time. So that was that was you shooting this stuff. That was you capturing. Yeah, uh, I started my first interview. I did uh, thirty years ago, actually, or thirty-one years ago, with a black Betamax camera that I that I got from a photography school I was uh, taking classes at, and I just went down to Florida with it and started interviewing people. So yeah, I'm, you know, most of the, I, I, all the interviews that. You know, we're in the film. Visually, I did. There, there was one interview with my grandfather, actually, which is audio interview, uh, that my cousin did. But, um, yeah, it's all research uh, that I've done over many years. Let me say, your cousin's audio technique is interviewing. Needed a little work, but... <laughs> in terms of what? Uh, just the style of asking the questions. Oh, yeah. But well, I, it, I, it, yeah. I think we I, have to be happy I, he I did it. I critiqued it as well, but... <laughs> no. I'm really grateful that it exists. It's a, it's a it's actually almost a four hour interview, and there's only sixteen minutes or so in the uh, the movie. So there's a lot more to it. But yeah, there were times where I was like, "Why didn't you ask him that question? Why didn't you follow up? Why didn't, you know?" But you know, thank God he he did the interview because I actually tried to do an interview when I was around ten with my grandfather. I had a little tape recorder that I had asked my parents for. And sat on my bed in my house with my grandfather and got about 10 minutes into the interview. And my grandmother interrupted calling my grandfather to dinner, uh, which is exactly what she did on several occasions with my cousin. So she was always like looking out for my grandfather, and making sure he had napped and he had eaten. And, you know, like him telling a story for posterity's sake seemed to, you know, take second uh, fiddle. Yeah. Yeah, your grandmother didn't seem to have a lot of interest in that. Maybe because she had heard it a lot, <laughs> and, you know, she lived it, and she just didn't understand the significance of it or what, what would happen with it. I don't know. Yeah, she she did seem to worry. Well, she was worried more about his his health, I think, than than anything. So, oh, wow. and, and when I and whenever I, I, by the way, I tried to interview her as well, and I would ask her as a kid. I remember she would say, "No, no, no, no." talk to Nathan, talk to Grandpa, you know, she just didn't want to sit down and talk about stuff for whatever reason. Hey, your grandmother was Ida? Yes. Okay. I, I got to tell you before we go any further, yeah. I had an Aunt Ida. Okay. And they they sound very similar. Okay. Bobby, Bobby, go get my cigs. Give me my cigs, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Give me a kiss, Bobby. Give me a little kiss, huh? All right. Go, 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 go get your Uncle High, okay? Go wake him up. Anyway. I hear that from a lot of audience members about various characters. And I felt, oh, she's just like my grandmother. She's just like my aunt. She's, I guess, you know, the Jewish uh, family personalities are, you know, very common to a lot of people. It, it, was, it was fun. I enjoyed hearing that. Um, had there, was there, is there much other video or, not video, but film or audio of, of your grandfather that exists beyond that interview? No. He, that was the only interview he ever did, other than the short one that he did with me. Of course, I mean, there are newspaper articles that that were done with you know quotes from him. But uh, I did hear that he turned down someone, an author that wanted to write a book about his life, because um, maybe he thought he I don't know he, he he just wasn't one to brag about his his success, and and he maybe wasn't interested and didn't think. You know, a book needed to be out there about him. I don't know. I just know that you know when he 
did the interview with my uh, cousin, he was 80, it was like a year before he died. So I think at that, by that point, maybe he realized it was somewhat important to get his story down on tape. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's all that exists. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing in the kitchen uh, film wise that I've ever come across that, that I believe exists. Um, you know, most footage in those days, I mean, even, even his funeral footage doesn't exist. Um, you know, I know there were a lot of TV cameramen and, and you know, TV stations that reported on his death. Um, that footage is gone. Uh, it was either re-recorded over, wiped out. I mean, I was lucky to have the one black and white film where they're talking. Um, the only reason I have that is because my dad saved the only copy that exists in the world in his, uh, you know, in his safe. For, for something like 50 years. And uh, lucky that the quality is still there. So yeah, surprisingly for a place that was that famous, uh, I would have thought there would be a lot more footage and, uh, you know, and audio of my grandfather in various situations. But um, I don't know, either turn people down or just they, they never uh, pursued it. And so what, what made you want to do this and start at such a young age and then pursue it now as an adult? And I'm guessing mid to late 50s is... Yeah, age? I'm 58. Okay. Um, I think just real interested in his stories as a kid. Uh, I think I'm a good listener. I I love to hear people's stories. I think I was born a documentarian in many ways. Um, just I knew from an early age that there was something important about him and something important about his life and his stories. And so, like I said before, I asked my parents for a tape recorder at a very um you know i didn't know enough at that time about keeping going back and back and back to ask my grandfather you know to keep, keep trying to get the re recordings but um i just knew it was important and it was important for me also maybe because my dad left the business when i was seven so that had some kind of impact on me um and uh that might have been a you know, a big part of the reason why I wanted to understand more because my, I, there was a kind of separation from the business and from my grandfather in that respect. And I never got to work at that place either, um, which is, you know, somewhat of a disappointment. So uh, I just, um, I don't know. I was just tenacious about pursuing the story over many years. Uh, of course, I missed many opportunities. There are many workers that died before I got to talk to them. And I wasn't doing this year in and year out. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I went to film school, I worked in the film industry, I did a lot of other things, and, you know, I had disappointments about missing people, but, you know, I kept at it, you know, over time, and, uh, you know, 30 years of, of research and 30 years of, of interviews uh, tells you that, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was time also, because my parents were getting old, and the 100th anniversary of Nathan's is next year, 2016 is the 100th anniversary. Uh, it became clear that it was time to wrap this thing up because I'm a perfectionist like my grandfather is, and I, I could go on for five more years easy, you know, until every last person is, is gone from this earth. You know? And even then, I might still be looking for, for information. One, one of the interesting things that you did, uh, uh, apart from your grandfather, is you actually went to Poland and tracked down his childhood home. And what did you find when you got there? Um, it was being torn down. Literally, I mean, Literally, it was yeah, the building was in rumble. You know, it was it was there, uh, you know, on the ground uh, uh, with some pieces of wood and, and concrete and you know scattered around. Um, so I never got to walk through the halls or you know through the rooms, uh, but I got some super eight footage of the uh, of the debris and that there's something beautiful about that too. Um, but you know. I, I, at least I got to walk around the town and, and get a sense of the place a little bit, at least in today's, you know, in, in today's world. How, but, much, how much do you think that your grandfather's experience as an immigrant colored what he did with his life? Uh, enormously. You know, he, he, you know, he, three of the four hours of the interview with my cousin were about his childhood. Because he left Poland when he was 19. So his memory was incredibly vivid about that time and it had a great influence on his life. All you have to do is listen to it to understand. I mean, he came from a very poor family, like I guess many people, he was one of 13. He knew what it was like to be hungry. 
Um, he knew what it was like to have very little possessions, very, you know, very few clothes. Um, and he knew what it was like to work from an early age. Uh, he started working as an apprentice to his father as a shoemaker from the age of six. He never attended school um, for, for various reasons. So he was illiterate for all intents and purposes, didn't speak, didn't read, uh, didn't, didn't speak. He didn't read and write, he spoke very well, actually. He has, he has great phrases and, and, and great stories to tell, but yeah, he couldn't read or write, essentially. And, um, you know, at, at the age of 11, he was living away from home in a bakery. Uh, he, he spent two years without seeing his family in a bakery, uh, waking up at midnight to help bake bread and then going out in the morning to sell it. So he had a, a real sense of, uh, you know, a super work ethic from a very early age, which carried forward and, and is a, a big part of why he succeeded so well, I think, at Nathan's, apart from other reasons. Also, just, just um, you know, the fact that food meant so much to him, you know, and that was another reason I think he went into the uh, restaurant business and why he worked in a bakery when he first came to New York, New York because he was fed, at least, when he, when he worked in, in the bakery when he was 11, you know, and uh, so a restaurant was was a place where he get, he knew he was gonna he was gonna always have food. He was never gonna be hungry, and I think it influenced his interest in feeding the masses too. So it wasn't just about taking care of himself, but he had this calling to take care of others, you know, and which he ne he never forgot the, his early age of uh, poverty and and hunger. Um, he was very empathetic toward people who who were in similar conditions even after his success. He was known to give charity without people knowing that he was giving the charity. He was, he was known to tell his, his managers to feed that person on the street who had no money and to hide when they uh, took care of them. I mean, he, he always he tried to be anonymous about his, his gift giving, which was very interesting. And the same with the way he took care of his workers. So I think, you know, he just never forgot what it was like to, to be poor in Poland, to work as hard as he did and to, uh, you know, take care of uh, people. Um, and, and, you know, he was taking care of his family. In Poland. So I think just the, the Coney Island crowds were an extension of his family to him. So he was keep the prices low so people could, could help their families, you know, and especially if you think about during the Depression, how many people were out of work, how many, you know, what the employment rate was that, uh, you know, he was selling uh, most items for a nickel and even at one time was selling a drink and a hot dog for a nickel. Um, that, you know, that was, that was all out of his childhood. And that all came from his childhood. His, his business philosophy came from his childhood. Also watching his mother, um, who was selling fruits and vegetables and other items in the market, how she treated people, how when they had, he, he, there was one story about, uh, it's not actually in the film, but it's one story about uh, buying potatoes in another town and selling them at, at the marketplace and making sure that everyone had a bag of potatoes. In other words, she didn't just try to get rid of them quickly, put the maximum price on them. She divided them up and said everyone should share in this because there were no potatoes in the town at the time. So that kind of philosophy that he witnessed to watch with, with, with his mother in terms of how she dealt with farmers and people uh, had a strong effect on him. And, you know, he, ne he never forgot his roots. I mean, that's one thing I can say for sure, which you know, I greatly admire about him. Um, he, he never lost that. Well, and you, you, uh, you, in fairness, I mean, and I don't mean fairness to you, but uh, your fairness to uh, to his story, uh, you you do tell two two tales about him. There are people who talk about his charity, as you just described, and then there's a few people who say that uh, you know he could be a bit of a son of a bitch when it came to t caring for his workers and and family members that. Uh, Right. Well, there's one particular story I think you're referring to, which is a, a family member's story, um, which is a, is a very complex story. But it's 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 just indicative of, you know, a family member who felt like he deserved more when it came to being left something in the will. You know, some, some you know, Joe, who, who worked for him and was like a brother and, and a son and, a, and it was a nephew um, to him, just felt left out because he wasn't included in the will. Um, but, you know, there are lots of workers that, you know, talk about or people that talk about the fact that he gave no interest loans 
to his workers. Um, that he paid high salaries. That he, you know, the minimum wage was, it, it was, you know, he, he was paying way above minimum. Wage, I should say. Um, so I think he was very generous to workers. But there are a lot of family members that have a different version of my grandfather, which is I don't think that unusual in business. It's very difficult for families to co coexist in, in business um, because their expectations are different. You know, they want to be treated differently. They want to be maybe be paid more. Um, so, I mean, I try to leave it up to the viewer a little bit in terms of, you know, giving different sides of stories and then allowing the viewer to, you know, ruminate about what that means or, or you know, who to believe, who not to believe, or, you know, what that tells you about a person. Because you, you never completely know everything about someone and, and everyone has, has a right to their story. It's a kind of the way that I approach it. Speaking of not knowing everything about a person, Lloyd, are, are there any warrants out for your arrest? Because those sirens are getting really close. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've never done anything illegal that I can pull. <laughs> they're, they're very loud. Uh, uh, so, this, is, this is New York City. Um, there's always going to be uh, ambulances running by well, in the background. Uh, one of the things, one of the other things, uh, speaking of, of, of how your grandfather viewed people, is that uh, talk about, and you can see it in the photos and the video, uh, he was fairly race and colorblind, we get the impression. that He, he hired blacks and Puerto Ricans to work side by side with a, probably a lot of Jews, I'm guessing, probably Italians, uh, uh, you know, in, in the, at, yeah. the, at the stand. Uh, yeah. And, and you, got the, you got, I mean, you got the sense that uh, that was unusual for the era. Yeah, I mean... Workers continuously said it was like the United Nations there. Uh, and we're talking about from very early on in the 20s and 30s. I mean, a lot of Chinese workers in the kitchen at that time, many illegal immigrants at that time working in the kitchen. Um, yeah, I mean, I really do think he was colorblind. Um, you know, it, it, you just have to look at pictures from, from the early days to see that there's every every race and, uh, you know, ethnicity on the counter. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't so always. I mean, what, what I've been told by people is that he was the first one to integrate the counter, and that was around 1949, 1950, that Coney Island was pretty segregated at that time. Um, so, you know, for many years there weren't blacks on the counter, and, and maybe even if he had them working in the kitchen, maybe he was concerned about reaction by customers in the 30s and early 40s, I don't know. I don't know what spurred that change, but I do know that people tell me the story about the early work black workers on the counter. And when you think about 1949 and 1950 in relation to Martin Luther King, I mean that's seriously early in in our history. Um, and I know that it wasn't easy being black and being on the counter because I did hear that they they had a lot of curses thrown their way, but. Uh, it was a real, you know, family community. Workers really stood up for each other, really, you know, worked well together, protected each other's backs, got into lots of fights with uh, customers over the years, jumped over the counter many a times uh, when, when someone got a, a mustard bowl thrown at them or, or plates were tossed, you know, into the gutter from the, from the counter, that kind of thing. Um, you know, they were a tough bunch. But, yeah, he was, uh, he, all he cared about is you worked hard, you know, that you were honest and, uh, you know, and then he, you know, you were his best friend. I mean, you were his family. Well, your grandfather, from what we heard in the film, expected guys to work basically 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It was a long day. Sure. Um, did you get any uh, any indication of uh, your grandfather ever having to deal with the mafia during that period of time? They were pretty strong <laughs> at that time. Even as now we hear about the Russian mob out on Coney Island, that the, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the, the five families were. Right. Um, I've never heard too many stories about the mob other than they were around that area. And, um, you know, it was a rough crowd and there, and there were fights sometimes between workers and the, like, I think it was the Frankie Yale gang. Um, so there was some of that going on, but the only story I heard, which was that one, one time a mafia person was in his office trying to get my grandfather to take a loan. Um, and he, politely refused them. Um, so I guess he never felt intimidated to the point where he 
felt like he had to be in bed with them in any way, you know, shape or form. I mean, um, that's that's the only story that I know. In terms of All right. So your dad is Saul, and your uncle Murray were, I think, Nathan's only sons, right? Exactly. And uh, Nathan Nathan wanted them both in the business, but of course it didn't work out that way. Sure. What what went wrong between the brothers, or was it between your dad and your grandfather? And were you ever satisfied that you got the full story, even if we didn't get it on film? Yeah, no, I think I understand the story pretty well. Um, no, I think well, my grandfather was a tough boss, uh, so he, he was tough on his sons in the business. Um, he wasn't someone who praised people normally, and uh, so you, you, you couldn't expect to get that. And I think that was, wasn't easy on his sons as well. And he had a different uh, attitude about, about work and, and a different attitude about the business. I mean, they came along, you know, in, 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 as part of a new generation that had different ideas about how the business should work, how it should be modernized, how it should expand. And my grandfather was, was, he wanted to be in control, wanted to, you know, he was satisfied with what he had created there and, and thought that he was always right. And uh, he learned that, you know, sometimes he had acquiesced to his sons. I mean, Murray came up with a seafood counter, which was a very successful, uh, you know, idea that he was willing to acknowledge was successful, was something that he had resisted. My dad came up with a delicatessen counter, was also um, very successful. But I think it was hard being one of his sons in the business. He, he expected them to be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They saw that there were managers who could run the place, and they wanted to be with their families on the weekends, which was the busiest time of the week. Um, so there were conflicts, conflicts between sons and father. And then, in addition, you had an older brother, Murray, who was in the business before my dad, um, and um, who, I guess, felt or... You know, in, in normal family relations, you know, the oldest son normally inherits the business. Um, so he felt that he was there first and that my dad should listen to him a little bit more because he had knowledge and experience. And uh, they just seemed to develop some sibling rivalry out of that. My dad was also a rebellious one and was in and out of the business a lot. As a youth, he was very political. So... He, for instance, wouldn't cross a picket line when there was one, whereas my uncle would. So, yeah, just, I think, normal brotherly jealousy um, and a father who couldn't resolve it. Uh, so that just festered and, and, you know, they just had different opinions about how to run the store, different opinions about personnel, and it, it festered and just got worse and worse. And, uh, you know, there came a time where... Actually, Murray left the business. I didn't get into that so much in the, in the film. There's, there's so much in the film that I couldn't get into a lot of that, those kind of details. But um, I'm actually, not to plug my book, but I'm writing a book right now, too, because uh, so many of these details are, you know, you know take a, lot, a long time um, to explain. But, you know, Murray left the business at one time, came back, and then, you know, ultimately my dad was not happy being there and working with his brother and had a t- hard time um, being in the business and decided to start his own business. So he, he went into the restaurant business and had something, you know, had a restaurant very similar to my grandfather. And uh, it was called Snack Time. It was in Manhattan. Uh, and even though my grandfather was very unhappy he was leaving, um, it solved some problems. I mean, you know, it was clear Murray was going to take over. Um, and, you know, my grandfather helped my dad with a loan and, you know, supported him, but he never really praised him for his for his business as 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 he was you know used to not praising people you know so i don't know if i answered your question but yeah family conflicts were were certainly part of uh, the business and and you know they extended to my grandfather's brothers too uh, and cousins and many of them were in the business in the early days uh, and for various reasons left over time only joe Handworker, who was his nephew, stayed on for 50 years. Others, you know, were there for 10 years and 20 years and, and whatnot. But the his his ideal was to have this family-oriented business that would would support the, the the large extended family 
and somehow it ended up with you know, only one son and, and one uh, relative remaining in the business, and that might have been for lots of reasons. Some of it jealousy, some of it my grandfather being so tough and, and, demand, and so demanding and, uh, you know, not making it easy on people in, in certain ways. I, that's, how, that's how I would explain it. If that answers your question. Yeah, I think it does. And you, you, you referred to something I also wanted to ask you about. One of the most compelling parts of the film, I thought, was you interview your dad while he's driving the car. And you're obviously sitting next to him and you're shooting him. And there's a lot of moments of silence when he thinks about things. Now, you can't believe that Nathan never praised your dad, his son. Uh, yeah. And in thinking about it, Saul, and I'll, just for people who aren't keeping up, Saul is your dad. Right. Saul can't seem to make sense of it either. And finally, after a pause, he says, if he didn't say anything, he was praising you. Do you buy that? And do you think that your dad bought that? Yeah, I, I, think, he, I think he did. I mean, you know, he, he might not have understood it, but I guess in those days, as my dad said, you didn't go into those psychological things. You know, you didn't discuss things like that. You just sort of accepted them and took them for, for the way they were. I think actually in some ways my uncle was a little more sensitive about that experience with his father than my dad. My dad sort of just, I really do think he just, you know, this is the way he is and this is the way it's going to be and, and he accepted it more or less. Um, and, you know, it. I think I what I understand is that, you know, for my grandfather, you know, praising someone was going to lead to negative, it was going to have negative results. It was going to have someone with an ego that was inflated maybe who was going to work a little less hard or, you know, who's going to ask for a uh, raise, you know, or, you know, it's just, it was just, he felt like he had to separate his, him, himself from his workers to a certain extent and from his sons to a certain extent to, to get the results that he needed in, in, in his business. He grew up very tough. I know he had some conflicts with his own father growing up, you know, and I'm sure he never got praised from him. So he didn't know any different. It was just the way he, he learned as a, as a kid. This is you just life is here. It's and you accept the way it is. And you you know you don't ex expect to to be praised for every little thing that you do, in, in, you know, within your work or in, in your life. So I th I, do, I do think my dad was, you know, accepting of. It. I'm sure he would have liked to have been praised. I think most people would, but I think I don't think it bothered him as much as it might have uh, my uncle. But once the film came out and it started airing at festivals and things around the country, and of course now it's out on DVD, uh, was it awkward for you having aired some of the family's dirty laundry in the film? I mean, the, the example I think of is the family friend who, who said your grandmother was never happy with Nathan, and her own husband told her to shut up about that. Right. Actually, that's, that's my grandfather's uh, sister who said that. Um, yeah, Aunt Lena. Uh, well, my, my dad's Aunt Lena. Right. Um, you know, I made a decision that I wasn't going to hold back on some of those things because uh, that's, you know, I wanted people to be able to speak. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and that was her point of view for whatever reason. And there might have been some truth to it. I believe there probably was some truth to it. I mean, um, and I believe uh, also Anna Singer, my dad's aunt, Anna, who says they were very happy together because, I mean, that was my experience of them. But um, I was always open to hearing different points of view and, and raising the idea that you never know completely what, you know, someone's married life is like or, or relations are like. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't easy being the wife to my grandfather in, in, in relation to his devotion to the business and, and maybe the ways that he was with his sons and the fact that the sons had conflicts and, and, and left the business at various times. I'm sure there was, you know... There was some pain and, and difficulty and some arguments within the family. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to shy away from family conflict, obviously. And, and I mean, I think it's it's real and it, it occurs in every family. And, you know, I, I, I was after the, the truth as, as best I could determine it, you know, and I wasn't interested in hiding things, you know, just and just presenting the Wikipedia, you know, Myth stories about my who my grandfather was, or you know, or, or all the nice things, you know, simple stories that you read in the newspaper. I I, I spent all this time to to delve into things. I wanted to share that and and have a dialogue with an, an audience about that. You know, have things that might resonate with them, and and have it be more than a story about more than just about Nathan's 
the place, you know, about families, about immigration, about, you know, working, uh, at, uh, you know, about memory, about all those things. I wanted it to, to speak to a larger audience than just, you know, someone who had been to Nathan's. Okay. Well, just a couple more questions. We'll let you go. You've been really great with your time. Um, I promised early on that we'd come back to LSD. And the, wild, the wildest person that you interviewed in this film is not, I don't think, a family member. I, I think he's a former counterman, right? He's a former waiter in the, the, the dining room. Waiter in the dining room, okay. And Richard he, Austin, yes. Yeah, he admitted frequently working high, once on LSD, several times slipping off to smoke hash in the men's room. Where on earth did you find this guy? <laughs> Uh, where else? But in California. <laughs> um, yeah, I put an ad in the uh, Jewish Forward, and his son, of all people, saw the ad and sent him the phone number, and Richard called me one day. I don't remember our conversation too well, but uh, he was uh, living in Chico, California. My sister lives in Berkeley. I was there, and so I, uh, I drove up met him in a park in Chico, and we sat. I had no idea what he was going to tell me. And I sat for, I think, three hours and recorded story after story, and uh, that, that was one of them. I mean, he's, he's a great character. I, I'm friends with him today. He, he lives both in California and Brooklyn. And, uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, well, he came, he came around in the 60s. So, you know, that was just like... Again, you know, a different generation of worker and, and a different time in, in America. Um, you know, so I, I thought his stories were wonderful and hilarious. And, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's Richard. That's how I found Richard. I don't know what boggles my mind more, the, the stories about him, you know, being high so much at work or that he reproduced. I, 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 it concerns me that he had children. Hopefully, they're all fine and there's no residual. He, he has only one that I know. Of. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I think he's quite nice. I'm, okay. I'm, uh, and, I, and I mean, no disrespect. I was just yeah. That, that surprises me more than all the stories. Those and those stories yeah. were just like, oh my god, what the hell? All right, so. Yes. As, as we kind of wrap up, uh, I, I got to ask because I'm not really sure. Does the Handworker family have any ongoing uh, involvement or interest in Nathan's? I'm sure people ask you that all the time. Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, the business was sold in 1987 by my uncle. Um, the one family member, one of his sons, his youngest son, stayed on for about five years and then no longer worked for the company. So right now, we have no relation to the business. Uh, the only thing we do have is the property. The, fa- the extended family does own the Nathan's property in Coney Island. So we, uh, we're landlords to, to Nathan's mm. in Coney Island. Other than that, n- nothing to do with uh, the business. And the, the original building is still operating today? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, bu- the building's undergone a lot of changes, at least the restaurant has, um, because of Sandy and and before Sandy, but particularly after Sandy, I mean, there was a lot of a lot of reconstruction that was done on it. But um, you know, so it's not the same. It's not the same signage, obviously. You know, in those days, it was hand painted. It's it's not like that today. Um, the counters are in different places. You know, the workers used to be up front. Now they're, uh, you know, the griddles are in the back. Um, so it's it's a very different orientation and different business and and the way everything is run. So. Well, I got to tell you, um, you did me such a, uh, gave me such pleasure. To st- my time there would have been the late '60s and in the early and mid '70s uh, when I went. My grandfather, we're close in age. I, I think our grandfathers. It's, it sounds like they they passed with, within a year, year and a half of each other, uh, by some coincidence. And to be able to see both the black and white and then the the color films, uh, and it just captured exactly what I could see in my head over the last 30, 40 years of remembering going there, I, you know, I got to say thank you. I mean, I, I'm sure you'll hear that a lot from people who, because there's so many millions of people who've been to that, Nathan's, who've been to Coney Island. So thank you for that. And um, you mentioned that you're, you're putting together a book based on uh, all the material you, you, you gathered. Yes, it's true. Yeah, there's about 300 hours of material that I had to condense into an hour and a half. And but although there are some extras on the DVD, which is yep. those are great. There's some really. Good, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. There's some, some great really, extras. 
yes, that are on the DVD, which are coming out today. Um, so I'm glad I was able to put those on there. Um, but yeah, I'm also working on a book to uh, explain even more about the, uh, the history. Well, get the book done, because I kept thinking it would have been great to have a companion book to read. Once I got started with the film, I thought, oh, I want to know more. So, right. Well, I'll talk to um, the distributor film movement to, to see if we can arrange that. Yeah. Well, finish the book and come back for that. And uh, folks, listen, you can uh, order Lloyd Handworker's documentary, Famous Nathan. It's now available on DVD, as we mentioned. Uh, you can get it wherever you typically get movies, online or in stores. Or you can order it right now at a great price from MrMedia.com. Uh, if you're watching the video on MrMedia.com, you know how this works probably. Uh, to the left or to the right under the video, you'll see a cover, the, copy, the, the cover of the DVD. You can click on it right now. It'll take you to Amazon. You can order it. They can have it to you. Uh, I, I understand by drone in 30 minutes, but uh, if you don't want it that quickly, uh, you know, in, in a day or two, you can have it. So please order, order the DVD. Um, do you have a, a, a website for the film? Yeah, you, well, there's you can go, you can get the DVD at filmmovement.com also, the distributor's uh, address. Uh, there's also famousnathan.com. Um, it's on Amazon as well, and some other sites, uh, which I don't know offhand. But <laughs> yeah, I'll hopefully get those out on the on the websites so everyone knows where where they purchased it. And can people find you on Facebook or Twitter, any of that kind of stuff? Sure. Also, Famous Nathan on uh, Facebook. Uh, they can also email me if they want at LloydHanworker at gmail.com. But uh, you can find my personal account on Facebook or the Famous Nathan account on Facebook as well. Right. Well, Lloyd Hanworker, I, as I said it before, I'm so grateful for having these images now that were always in my brain. They're real. They're in a film. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and being a guest on Mr. Media today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed talking. Thanks. recorded live before a studio audience full of famous Nathan's countermen who won't be putting up with any bullshit from the likes of you, fella, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida.